Hi all, our notable game today is another one from the Amazing Engine World, the Amazing Competition, the TSAC Season 8 Stage 2. This is a Stage 2 game, we're in Stage 3 at the moment, uh, or more. So Stockfish, our hero, my personal hero, my analytical assistant, version 070915, was playing Fire 5B engine. Now the ratings are interesting. Stockfish here is rated, given as a rating as of three two two two. Fire five B was three one two six. Now Fire or Firebird, as it's called, or Fire Extreme, is a UCI compliant chess engine by Norman Smith. Until version three, derived from Ivanhoe and the Ippolit series of programs, with the help of Milos Stranitsvatrilik. Uh, and it was initially called Firebird and later renamed due to Fire due to a trademark naming conflict. It was released as open source, file license under the GNU uh, GPL, and the sources were later closed with Windows executables available for download for recent Intel processors. It features magic bit boards. It can be configured with more than 70 UCI options and applies an SMP parallel search. It is one of the leading engines on one of the, the major engine rating lists. Now here, the opening is e4 from Stockfish and c5, knight f3, d6, and we see it an open Sicilian. And here knight f6, knight c3, and classically now knight c6. So this is like, I think the Sicilian classical variation where knights come out first. And then we have bishop g5. Now the usual move in opening book According to live book is e6. That's very popular here. Bishop d second, bishop d seven second most popular. Queen b6. These have all got hundreds of games, but the move choice of fire five b here is h6. This is very interesting actually because um, it's it's kind of it's a very rare uh, chosen move compared to the others. We're, we're talking uh, 29 games in live book. <clears throat> and essentially, it encourages White to give up the bishop pair, because doubling the pawns here would seem to be actually having a lot of pros to it, to give up that bishop pair to damage Black's pawn structure. And then that's exactly what Stockfish did. Bishop takes f6, g takes f6. And here, this has been seen before, and usually plays with white. Well, there's 10 games in my book. Queen d2 has been played. But Stockfish goes crazy here and volunteers potentially to give up another bishop with bishop b5. Black played bishop d7, and here white castled with a6. And yes, Stockfish has not got a, a major priority for giving up the bishop pair if there's especially if it sees compensating factors it gives up the light square bishop now after b takes c6 there is a classic kind of game in the immortal game collection on the channel if you remember where Ivanchuk destroyed kasparov giving up the bishop pair similar sort of position in the sicilian can these bishops really be liberated in a practical sense. This is the key thing. We talk about the bishop pair as a Steinitzian positional advantage to gain, but in this sort of position, well, it's compensated immediately, of course, visibly by the pawn structure, which is another major element of the position. But is it the pawn structure here which also stops the liberation of either bishop, especially the dark squared one? Looks particularly miserable here. Can White really tap into this? Well, White's next move, knight f5, immediately puts the brakes on e6 because the knight takes d6, and black really doesn't want to give up the light square bishop. And also, if black gave up that bishop, white would get that e4 square for the knight potentially as well, as well as the open line on the e file, and free access with queen h5, it looks far too dangerous. So black played queen c7, and already there's a very uncomfortable feeling about black's position here. Just at move 12, really, it, there's a, it looks uncomfortable. Queen f3, uh, rook g8. We could say perhaps that maybe black, if it really chose h6, uh, it shows maybe there is an inherent weakness in engines as far as opening theory is concerned, because they can't take in the longer term implications 
or the liberation of the bishops. Maybe there's a slight issue with, with the evaluation function. Are the bishops really uh, something to pay the price for here with that h6 move? Now, after rook g8, we have rook ad1. So already, you know, black can't castle, it seems, very easily in this position. The castling on the queen side is notoriously pretty dangerous. We see black playing rook g5, and this rook is kicked back with h4, rook g8, g3. The g file is hardly scary. There's no support for that rook on g8. We see rook b8, black cast, uh, can't castle on the queen side now forevermore. b3, queen a7. Okay, I mean, in principle, it seems both black's rooks are active in inverted commas. Black has the bishop head in a token manner. Uh, we see rook f e1. But white now looks as though with this powerful centralization, uh, white has a firm grip on the position here and any potential breaks by black. Black plays a5. And then we see knight a4, which actually implies unblocking the c pawn. That c4, c5 might be very useful. You can imagine if takes white can actually simply just double rooks then in the center and the black rooks which are dispersed might not be able to avoid a disaster here in that scenario. We see rook g6 and white carries on c4. This is dangerous this c5. It's a common recurring strategic theme uh, in many positions. So open up that d file. Black plays c5. Okay, maybe potentially he's going to take here one day. Knight c3, bring the knight back. Now that lovely d5 square has been opened up for a knight. And in fact, after rook b7, white puts the knight on d5 here. So interestingly, you might think as well, isn't that e6? Well, there's never really a threat with e6. Because uh, the king's in the center, basically. It will be far too dangerous. White could either just retreat the knight or potentially work out if, if the knights could be left there. His only takes here is winning that rook with check. So the knights sit pretty here on d5 and f5. It's been, this is now becoming a picture of misery for the classic bishop pair. This is really, it seems a major exception if there is one where black has structural defects. No potential scope for liberating the bishops, especially miserable as the f8 bishop. We see queen b8. So how does white actually win here? No. What actual break is possible? It seems e5 is not viable. White plays rook d3. And now after bishop c6, white creates a very dangerous idea, which will be winning. And it's based on this weakness. White plays queen h5. And basically with queen h5, the h6 pawn is the vulnerable pawn in black's entire position. If you look at black's entire position, this pawn is now got two pieces attacking it. And it just needs the rook to be dislodged with knight f4, which would justify that pretty knight on, it, on d5 coming back to move the rook back just to take on h6. Black now has to make some major concession to try and generate its form of counterplay. Otherwise, it's just going to be run over, basically, with knight f4. Black plight tried the desperate-looking a4. Now, you might think, well, okay, let's have a look. e6 instead. Knight f4. Tanks, tanks is no good. It's check, winning the rook. So that doesn't work out very well. If rook a7. Knight f4. Let's just run this through. Knight takes h6, threatens, queen takes f7. And this is basically a disaster for black, this position, because white's h pawn will just win the position here. Say h5, and white's just going to play queen g7 and move the h pawn. So black is really in a desperate state in computer terms here. So playing a4. And what it does, it's, it's open to backfire here. White just actually takes this pawn. There might be a promise for damaging the pawn structure. Okay. But black is not in a position really even to play bishop takes a4 here. There's a backfire on the a file. With the rook positioned here, it's very flexible. 
rook a3. Black played queen a7 here. If bishop takes a4, rook a3, this position, white can change gears for the queen side, for example, like this. Instead of going for h6, which would allow some counterplay on the b file, white can now just use the newly opened a file with queen f3 going to a3. And immediately you see dangers on the back row here, for example. It's a disaster scenario with knight c7 coming in. And then if black's made totally passive like this, then going for the pawn is true computer style. This is a computer variation, of course, just, just to demonstrate a disaster scenario. So yeah, white would basically create an infiltration on the queen side and then go back for the h pawn and that would stuff out that would reduce to the counterplay that black was trying to get with the pawn sack to a minimum that's why i'm showing you this that um, the a file is used drive all the pieces back then go back for the h6 pawn so black dare not take that pawn basically black plays queen a7 and we have queen f3 and again now we've got things like rook a3 or rook b3 queen a5 yeah Rook a3 if queen takes a4 is just very unpleasant. That would actually be winning the queen, in fact. If we have a look at this, ne nearly winning the queen. Well, there's this, but uh, this looks as though there should be some disaster off the check, like winning the bishop, for example, if the king has to move. So, yeah, that's not palatable. So we see queen a5, rook c1, because the queen was actually hitting the rook. Queen a7, yeah, black is reduced to helplessness, and now it's technically a pawn down. a5, yeah, the queen can't really take without laying rook a3. Rook b8, and now rook b3, so the b file is challenged that rook takes. Queen takes, yes, yeah, so this is an extra pass pawn basically. e6, isn't this winning material? Not really. Rook b1. There's a problem with the back row in conjunction with that bishop on f8. But black has nothing in this position, no counterplay whatsoever. It just takes on f5. Check, check. And this is an easy end game to win, this rook and pawn end game. Bishop takes, c takes, king c7. Rook takes f7, all the black pawns are dropping off here. E takes f5, rook g8, and with this, it was adjudicated based on the valuation of both engines as a loss for black. The pawns are all dropping off. Rook takes f6 will win yet another pawn. It's pretty hopeless. Basically, it shows that brute force actually has, has major limitations as well as openings are concerned long-term damage can be done early on in the opening and the most dramatic example of stored long-term damage is damage to pawn structure pawn structure in relation to the bishop pair was demonstrated to show that the bishop pair cannot be liberated sometimes with double pawns in the position this is a vivid example where the bishops are absolutely useless not only that the double pawns meant an isolated h6 pawn so the knights were pretty, but also threatening to coordinate to win the h6 pawn. It caused black to lash out with a pawn sack. White being a computer neutralized first all the play on the queen side and would be prepared to, in the variation shown, make sure black is not using the b file at all and then simply return back to torture the h6 pawn when safe to do so. Instead in the game, anyway, after winning that pawn, which was never recaptured, White just simplified and was able to simplify down basically into a winning rook and pawn ending. It shows that uh, yeah, early opening mistakes, it doesn't matter what brute force you've got, early opening mistakes can actually basically spell disaster. Uh, doesn't matter what computational power you have. And that's an interesting thing, especially for correspondence players. Uh, one of the leading uh, British correspondence players, Coleman, Peter Coleman, 
uh, once told me that actually in in uh, correspondence chess yeah the, the importance of the opening is absolutely critical and this game shows why you can never sometimes really recover from a bad opening okay comments or questions on YouTube thanks very much